Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing to teach on how to harness your emotions. That's the uh, teaching that I started two weeks ago. I spent one week teaching directly from that, and then this week I've been teaching on self-centeredness, the source of all grief. And this is not a, it's not a different teaching, it's just a different application, like a specific application of what I'm talking about. And I tell you, this is a powerful teaching. You know, let me use this passage of Scripture from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, this, these are the verses that the Lord used to change my life. When I was in high school, I realized I was going to have to start making decisions about college and what choices I needed to make for my life. And so I got to seeking God for His will, and I spent 18 months, I mean, just devouring Scripture. And at Christmas of 1967, the Lord gave me these verses and said at the end of these verses, this is how you know the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And so I said, man, this is it. And I just backtracked and said, what do I have to do? What is it that causes me to prove, to make manifest of the physical senses the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? And I started studying uh, Romans 12, 1, where it says you have to become a living sacrifice. And I mean from December of 67 until March the 23rd of 1968. This just occupied my focus. And God, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? How do I sacrifice my life to you so that I can prove a good, acceptable, and perfect will? And anyway, God showed me a lot of things. And I had this miraculous encounter with the Lord, March the 23rd, 1968. I was 18 years old. And I mean, God showed up. And a lot of things happened, but here in a nutshell is what happened. I got born again 10 years before that when I was 8 years old. But I became a Pharisee. I was basically told that God would move in your life proportional to how holy you were. And so I tried to be holier than anybody I knew. I mean, I read the Word. I was witnessing to people. I was leading two and three people a week to the Lord when I was a teenager. I was doing everything that they told me, but I became proud of who I was, thinking that God owed me something, that I had to step up on everybody else because I was so holy, and I became a modern-day Pharisee, looking down my nose at everybody else, thinking I was better than everybody else. And it's a long story, but after three or four months of, God, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? How do I yield myself? God showed up in this prayer meeting on a Saturday night, there was a group of about seven or eight of us, and God just removed this, these blinders from my eyes, pulled this veil back, and showed me I, how arrogant I was and how I was trusting in myself. And I don't have the words to describe it, but I, in my heart, I didn't see this with my physical eyes, but I saw God. I saw the holiness and the purity of God. And I saw myself in comparison. And even though I stacked up really good against people, compared to God, man, I didn't deserve anything except wrath and punishment and rejection. And I, I just came, I don't have the words to describe that, but I saw that God forgive me. And I spent an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes turning myself inside out because I thought God... I was in His presence, and I thought God was going to kill me. I was one that was told that, I was told that God killed my dad when I was 12 years old, that God's the one that judged people. And when I saw how ungodly I was in this hypocritical attitude, I mean, I honestly thought God was going to kill me. But before He killed me, I was going to confess everything. And I hadn't done that much outwardly. 
I've never said a word of profanity. I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I was Mr. Righteous. But, boy, my emotions and my attitude and this arrogance and, and pharisaical attitude, man, I began to turn myself inside out and confess this stuff. And anybody that it was anybody in my life was in that room, the pastor of the church, my best friends, everybody. And I just turned myself inside out and confessed all of these things and humbled myself and repented uh, with the logic that right before God killed me, I was going to confess everything I was thinking of, so maybe if I died, I'd go to heaven instead of hell. And I mean, for an hour and 45 minutes, I just turned myself inside out until I had nothing left to give. And, you know, without realizing it, I became a living sacrifice. I laid myself on the altar. And I said, God, here I am, as sorry as it is. And I want to give it to you. I'm sorry. And I repented and turned my life over to God. And after I got through doing that, there was just nothing left to say. I didn't have anything to repent of. I repented of anything I'd ever done or ever would do. And I was just laying there on the floor in a puddle of tears. And instead of judgment and wrath, I felt God's supernatural love for me. And for four and a half months, I was just gone someplace. I was caught up in the presence of God. It was awesome. But anyway, my reason for sharing all of that is that you know what I did? It was this, what I've been talking about, that self-centeredness is the inroad of every negative thing that Satan wants to do. He can't torment you without you loving yourself. He can't intimidate you without loving yourself. And when you quit loving yourself and when you lay yourself down, when you become what Jesus said, that you are a, a living sacrifice, You've died unto yourself. It's just, it takes away fear. It takes away being hurt and offended because you don't love yourself that much. And again, I'm at a loss of how to explain this, but this is what happened to me. And I died to myself. It's not a one-time thing. It says right here that you have to be a living sacrifice. That sounds like a contradiction. If you're a sacrifice, that's when something dies how can you be a living sacrifice? What that means is it's not something you just do one time. It may start one time with me. I can quote March the 23rd, 1968. And I can tell you that God did a work in my life and it started me in a direction that was totally opposite anything I'd ever done before. But there have been thousands, tens of thousands of times since then that I've had to crawl back on that altar. You know, the problem with a living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off the altar. You've got to keep yourself on that altar. It has to be a continual commitment. And God still deals with me today when I start getting selfish and I start thinking just about myself. I've had people come up after I teach on this and say, would you please help me to just die to myself so that it'll be over with and I'll never have another problem with it. And I said, I can help you to start that process of dying to yourself. But I said, the only way you can totally get 100% free of this self and wanting to promote yourself at the expense of other people is just to die and leave this body. As long as you're breathing, you are going to have a tendency towards only seeing things from your selfish point of view. And it's a process. You have to start this process and make a decision to die unto yourself. But then you have to continue to do it. You know, every one of us came into this world 100% self-centered. You may not have thought about that, but your mother just stayed up all night long in labor, went through all this intense pain, did all of these things, and yet you show up on the scene and you aren't going to give her a moment's rest. You're going to wake her up in the middle of the night. If you want your diaper changed, if you want to be fed, if you want something, you will cry and wake up the whole house. You could bring a baby into a church service and there's people there that need to hear the Word of God and they need help. They need God to touch them and a baby doesn't care about anybody but itself. A baby is the center of the universe. It doesn't know that another person exists. It's all about their need. Whatever they want, they will wake anybody up. They will disturb any meeting. They are the center of the universe. And you know what? When you're a week old, when you're a month old, you can excuse that. But the problem is that we've got people that are 30, 40, 50, 60 years old and they still think that they're the center of the universe. 
We all came into this world self-centered, and it's understandable, but a parent is supposed to teach your children that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. We aren't doing a very good job teaching that lesson. Most people, men, are more about receiving than they are about giving, but that's what Jesus said. We're supposed to teach our children that it's when you lose your life and you lay your life down for other people, that's what's really going to give you satisfaction and contentment. It's not in having everything just come to you. We're supposed to teach our children this, and yet most of us haven't got this message ourselves. And so instead of thinking more about our children and doing what's right for our children, we'll do what's better for us in the short term. Like every one of you have probably seen some kid in a supermarket or someplace, and they want a piece of candy or they want something, and the mother says, no, it'll ruin your dinner, you can't have it. And yet the kid, just it's all about them. They will fall down on the floor. They will throw a temper tantrum. They will cry. They'll roll around on the floor. And you know what most parents will do? Rather than do what's best for that kid and teach them that, hey, you are not the center of the universe. We do not take orders from you. You need to learn what's right and wrong. You can't just go by how you feel. You need to learn that there's right and wrong things to do. Instead of taking that approach, instead of spanking the kid, disciplining them somehow, you know what the average parent will do? They'll give the kid what the kid wants and reward that selfish behavior because the parent themselves is selfish. And the parent themselves is thinking, what's everybody thinking about me? Everybody's going to think I've got a spoiled brat. Everybody's going to criticize me. And rather than do what's best for the kid, they'll actually reward this selfish behavior and reinforce it and just strengthen that selfish motivation on the inside of that kid. And then the kid grows up to be 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, and you know what? They no longer fall on the floor and throw a temper tantrum, but it's the exact same thing now in an adult type of way. The wife will just turn the cold shoulder because that husband didn't do what they wanted, and I mean they will punish that husband by not speaking unto him. You can walk into a room and cut the ice with a knife it's so thick, and I mean, they will, they will punish somebody. They are going to throw an adult temper tantrum until they've got satisfaction and felt like they've punished that person as much as they deserve. All that is is an adult temper tantrum. It's an adult brat. You know, I know many people don't like me talking this way. They think, what right do you have to say this? I don't know you personally. I'm just presenting truth. I'm telling you, it's the truth that's going to set you free. Galatians 4.16 says, Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I'm telling you the truth because this will help you. I'm saying we came into this world 100% self-centered and we're supposed to come out of that, especially if you've been born again, especially if God's unconditional, selfless love is on the inside of you. We ought to be turning the other cheek. We ought to be esteeming other people better than ourselves. And yet the sad fact is most people are just totally all wrapped up in themselves, and they make a very small package and they are just self-centered and because of it, their whole life, this is how Satan has inroad into your life. If you weren't self-centered, self-sufficient, defending self, if you had turned those things over to the Lord, you would let God defend you. You let God direct your life. You were responding to Him. You trust Him. You aren't insecure because it's not up to you. You've got a Father who's going to take care of you. And if you were living that kind of a life, I guarantee you, it just takes strife away. It takes anxiety away. It takes fear away. It doesn't matter so much what people say. I'm, I'm not, again, not saying that you like rejection and criticism, but you get to where God's acceptance overwhelms anybody else's rejection. And you can do that, but it's not going to happen accidentally. It's got to happen on purpose. And, you know, the scripture says, the Lord said over in 1 Peter chapter 5, to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that He might exalt you in due time. God doesn't humble you. He, you have to choose to do this. If it's done to you, it's humiliation. The only way it can be humility is if you chose it, if it was voluntary. If somebody forces it upon you, then it's humiliation. God is not going to force you to turn the other cheek, to love people, 
to submit your life unto Him and trust Him. You have to choose to do it. And I'm aware that there's many people watching this program that I may be the only person you've ever heard say these kind of things. There's other people that say it, but there's not enough saying it. And this may be the first time you've ever heard these things. And so maybe you just thought that this selfish attitude, this selfish lifestyle where everything is absolutely about you and you don't even consider anybody else, everything is all about you and your rights, it may be that you've never had this challenge. You've not even know that there was a different way to think. And so I'm not trying to condemn you for where you are, but I am saying that it's wrong and that this is not the way that God made us to be. This is not how He wants you to live. This is not God's will for people to be just promoting themselves at the expense of everybody else. Stab them in the back, walk over them, do whatever to promote yourself. That's an ungodly concept. And you know what? It's a, it's a process. Like I told you, I had this experience March the 23rd, 1968. I tell you, it did a major thing to me. My life was instantly changed. I've never gotten over it. But you know what? I've had to come back to that and continue that commitment a million different times. There's things that rub me the wrong way, and I have a tendency. I could go back to being selfish and promoting myself and worrying and defending myself and the same as anybody could. You know, I met James Irwin one time. This was one of the astronauts that walked on the moon. And I was in Vietnam when they walked on the moon. I missed all that. And so I didn't see these things. And I was always interested in this. And I always thought that the technology and the things that they used to get there must have been absolutely amazing. And I was on a television program with James Irwin in uh, Denver. And when I found that, you know, he was the other, I gave him my book and signed it. He gave me his books and signed it. And I started grilling him and asking him questions because I missed out on that. And I was interested to know. And I was trying, I was, you know, just amazed at the technology and the way they did it. And he began to start correcting me. And he says, you got it all wrong. He says, they actually blasted off. And they orbited the earth for a while. And then they shot that thing towards the moon. And he said, but every 10 minutes for four days on that trip to the moon, they had a course correction. And he said, sometimes it was only a fraction of one degree. But other times, he said that that capsule was actually going 90 degrees opposite the direction they wanted to go. And sometimes they would have to have a two, three, four minute burn to get back here on track. And so instead of them just going perfectly to the moon, the truth was they threw that thing towards the moon and then had a course correction. So they really went to the moon like this. That was brand new to me. I didn't know that. And then he told me that they had a 500-mile long landing strip that they had planned to land in. And when they landed on the moon and when he got out of the lunar lander, he was within five feet of being outside of that target area. 500 miles long, and they nearly missed it. They were less than five feet from being outside of it. And you know what that did? It told me that it wasn't perfect. They didn't do everything perfectly, but they corrected, and you know what? They got there, and they got back. And as he was telling me those things, the Lord spoke to me about this very thing, about being a living sacrifice. And I knew that it was a process and yet some people, see, they just want to make a commitment and say, I'll never be selfish again. I'll never promote myself. I'll never be dependent upon other people's reaction. I'm just going to be dependent upon God. And they think that you can just have a one-time experience and never have another problem. And the Lord spoke to me. It's just like that trip to the moon. You just blast off. Now, you do have to blast off. You have to escape Earth's atmosphere. You have to start in that direction but then there's going to be a course correction every 10 minutes for the rest of your life. I often tell people, you know, we give away free CDs and stuff, and I said, you may get back there. You may make this decision that, God, I want to be a living sacrifice, and please help me to put you first and honor you and other people more than myself. You die to yourself, and then you go back there to the back table, and the person in front of you gets the very last free CD. And you've got an opportunity for a course correction. Are you going to be upset and get mad and be bitter at them because you didn't get something? Or are you going to rejoice that, praise God, they got something? 
Somebody's going to pull in front of you in the parking lot, and instead of saying, you know, meh, or waving at them with one finger, Instead, you say, well, bless you, and let them go first. You got an opportunity for a course correction. See, this is the way it is. You make the decision, but you don't get, it's not like you kill self and it ceases to exist. You just get to where you subject it to God, and you have to do it over and over and over and over. I remember many years after this experience that I told you about, March the 23rd, 1968, I'd been on radio for probably 15 years. I was in a church service in, in Dallas, Texas. I was looking around. There's thousands of people there, and I was thinking, I bet you that hundreds of these or maybe thousands of these people have heard me on radio. I've been on there for 15 years, but they didn't know what I looked like. I had been on that guy's television, pro, and I was sitting there wondering, does anybody know who I am? You know what that is? That's selfish. I was feeling my own importance. And this was, I don't know, 20 something years after I had this encounter with the Lord and I made this decision to put Him first. And I started getting back into thinking about who I was. Does anybody know me? And about that time, the pastor had me stand up in front of the whole group and announce me. And it was like God put a spotlight on me right when I was at my most selfish thinking about myself, and I felt like I was just naked in front of those people. Like, you know, God, the timing of it was perfect to just point out that, Andrew, here you are being selfish again. Did that mean that I didn't blast off 20-something years earlier? Did that mean that I hadn't made that commitment? Did that mean that I avoided it? No, I've got to go back and become a living sacrifice again. No, I meant that with all of my heart. But you know what? I've never done it perfectly. And I've, I have things come up in me. And as soon as the Lord shows me that I'm getting back into promoting myself and doing these kind of things, I just repent of it. I don't have to recommit myself. I'm totally committed to doing it, but I'm just not doing it perfectly. I've never done anything perfectly in my life. And God knows that. And I'm a living sacrifice as much as I can be, but I'm not a perfect person. And I'm saying all of these things for your benefit that if you've received what I've said this week, if you've made this commitment and say, God, I want to put you and other people first. I do not want to be living for myself. This is the root of all grief in my life. And you want to put God first. You could make that decision, and yet you will fail. And there will be times that you are selfish again. It doesn't mean that you didn't mean it. It might mean that you didn't mean it. Maybe you weren't sincere, but you could be sincere, mean it, and you're still going to fail. You're going to have to have course corrections. Just because you've got a course correction doesn't mean you aren't moving in the right direction. And I want to encourage you that God wants to work this in you more than you want it. God wants you to be a living sacrifice more than you want to be one. And if you would just humble yourself. You know, I'm out of time right now, but we've got a number on your screen. If you would call, we've got people there that they've heard this teaching. They've been through our Bible college. They know what I'm talking about. They've made these decisions. They could help you. I tell you, it would be tremendous just to be able to have a date that you could write down and say, on this day, I made this decision. Andrew's teaching titled Self-Centeredness, The Source of All Grief is available in a 56-page booklet. You can get your first copy of the booklet free of charge when you go to our website. If you'd like additional copies for yourself and others, they're available for £2.99 each. Go to awme.net to get your copies. Andrew's complete teaching series titled Harnessing Your Emotions is available on either CD or DVD as seen on our daily TV program. Each is available for £13. Or you can get this teaching in book form for £8.99. Go to awme.net to see the options. We'd also like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled Christian Philosophy for £9.99. Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources through our website at awme.net. While you're there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. Or you can order through our helpline Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. 
When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. If the lines are busy, remember, you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, 7 days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events. In the month of March, he'll be in Overland Park in Wichita, Kansas, Norman, Oklahoma, and Colorado Springs, Colorado. In April, he'll be in Jacksonville, Orlando, and Miami, Florida, in Washington, D.C., and in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. And in May, he'll be in Atlanta, Georgia, in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and in Telford, England. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. And we've come to the point where we know that we have a contract, we have a covenant with the living God, and it's written in Christ's blood. When you speak the word of God, it'll go forth and accomplish what's been set forth to do. It'll produce hope, it'll produce peace, it'll produce joy, it'll produce finances, it'll produce help, it'll produce food, it'll produce everything that you need. From overwhelming debt to financial freedom, Watch the Tim and Nikki Abello story. Log on to awmi.net, look to the left, and click on Ministry News. Then click on Today's News Story. Find out what's happening with the world changers at Andrew Wallach Ministries and Karis Bible College today. Married in 1981 and living in Puebla, Mexico, Alex and Julie Palomares realized that they were missing a key ingredient in their lives, a personal relationship with God. One year later, each gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. Soon thereafter, at a home Bible study, they each received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Nearly 26 years, three children, and 11 relocations later, Alex and Julie began watching Andrew Womack on his Gospel Truth television program. They were transformed by the message of grace and faith that they heard every day on the show. They felt led to order the Karis Bible College correspondence course they'd seen advertised. Completing the first year studies by August, they decided to sell their home and move to Colorado Springs to begin their second year of studies. Being totally immersed in the almost too good to be true gospel taught by Andrew and the instructors at Karis. Their second year CBC mission trip took them to the city of Queretaro, Mexico. And after completing their third year apprenticeship at CBC, they felt the Lord directing them to return there and to begin to make disciples, fulfilling Andrew's vision of 2 Timothy 2.2. Today, this energetic couple continues to change lives by teaching the truths they learned at CBC. If you'd like more information, log on to charisbiblecollege.org and click on Campus Locations.